You're listening to Mr. Liverpool himself, Frank Carlisle, exclusively, exclusively on Mersey Radio. This fella's only in his early 20s and he's a, a documentary maker, filmmaker and everything else maker and he's absolutely amazing. And his name is Curtis Ryan Woodside and he's all the way from South Africa and he's right with us now. Hello, Curtis. Hi, Frank. How are you guys doing? Oh, I'm doing absolutely fantastic. So, uh, have you been very, very busy lately? I have been very busy. I've been, you know, traveling quite a lot. And I've just, I got back from Egypt now and I've just made a 90-minute documentary yeah. about, you know, traveling through Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, did you find any obstacles, especially like with what's going on now? Uh, were in the Middle East, did you find, or in other words, was you a little bit apprehensive about going there? No, not at all. You know, it was 100% safe. I never felt like anything was going to happen at any point. Um, you know, with what has just happened, you know, with the, the churches and all of yeah. that there, yeah. that was not in the main tourist areas. That was completely in, in a separate city called Tanis. Right. So um, I, I would say it was definitely safe. And I mean, I come Egypt is Africa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen, uh, can you tell the listeners what your documentary is all about, please? Well, you know, I have been obsessed with ancient Egypt since like almost my whole life. And I decided you know, for my 22nd birthday, I'm going to go to Egypt, spend over two weeks there traveling from the top of Egypt to the bottom of Egypt and just exploring all these ancient monuments and things that I've been wanting to see. And really the film is mainly about traveling through Egypt, but also about me, you know, I have this very big obsession with Queen Nefertari, the queen of Ramses II. Yeah. And yeah. that that was really the big highlight for me on that trip. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, as well, about Egypt, everyone associates Egypt with the one and only. Every time you mention uh, ancient Egypt, especially, two names always come up. But one of them is synonymous, and that is Cleopatra. Did you do anything on Cleo? You know what? Um, I did talk about her a little bit. The next time I'm going, we're, we're going to be going to um, Dendera Temple oh, and yeah, Shalai yeah. Temple, which is Dendera was built by Cleopatra the Great. I mean, there were 11 queens called Cleopatra. Um, but yeah, Cleopatra is not really... She came much later in the new no, kingdom. I, I under, no, I fully understand that, Curtis, but can you understand the way some, you know, people, the majority of people, and me included, uh, you know, and, and even the, the lads here, if you said two names, give me two names, you know, if you'd say to them, or 10 out of 10 people would always say, if, you, if they knew anything at all about Egypt, they'd come out with two names, and that's Cleopatra will be one, and Tutankhamun. The next. Exactly. I mean, and the ironic thing about about um, Tutankhamun's story, I mean, his his successor did his best to try and get rid of of Tut's legacy, and because of what he did, actually, it's preserved his tomb, and that's the reason why we know him is because they tried to erase him, and by hiding everything. Yeah. It was there for us to discover, and it just, you know, blew up all over the world when, you know, Howard Carter made this amazing discovery in 1922. That's right. Uh, and the case of Tutankhamun, have you done anything <laughs> on that? No, it's, you know, because people are fascinated by... Uh, the, listen, are you sitting outside by any chance? Uh, no, I'm, I'm I'll inside. I'll tell you for why. It sounds like crickets, uh, uh, you know, in the background to you. There's a little noise coming um, through. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not a uh, spoiling anything. It's just that we, we 
we all felt a little bit exotic. You know, with the thick I thought you were actually there. in Egypt, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. I was like, I'm, sitting on, the I'm sitting on the Nile right now, Skyping you. I've got amazing signal out here. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Um, anyway. Anyway, I can't, I've got messages <laughs> through, you see, that, that's all. I'm just saying this is fascinating stuff. Carol Brown, she said, um, she said, this is fascinating stuff about ancient Egypt because uh, you're right, Frank, she said, and John, by saying that the likes of Tutankhamun and Cleopatra uh, uh, and the, obviously, it, it, it's the, it's the wonderful pyramids, it's the wonderful pyramids uh, that, that are synonymous with Egypt and Lawrence of Arabia, as she said, so... Yeah, um, that that's the thing. I mean, the funny thing is so many people living in Egypt don't know about their own history. And I would really like to inspire not only people in Egypt, but people all around the world to just start showing a little bit more interest in the history, not only just the history of Egypt, but history in general, but that's what I would really like. And I would like to show through my documentary that, you know, Egypt is this great country. You can go visit, you can go look at the monuments, or you can even just go as a tourist on the Nile on a cruise and just relax. I know. Well, this is it. You say, well, again, uh, you've got these wonderful, um, wonderful pyramids, deserts, Bedouins, You've got everything there. And as you said, you kept uh, out of the mainstream, didn't you? All these tourist places. What was the finest thing, without giving too much away, that you actually filmed? The finest thing? I I had two really amazing things, two tombs that are closed to the public that I was able to go into. The first one was the tomb of Pharaoh I. He was the successor of Tutankhamun yeah, and he was actually Tut's advisor throughout his life yeah. and it was really amazing to go into that tomb because as you'll see in the documentary the tomb that I was buried was the tomb that was actually intended for Tut King Tut yeah he uh, um, Pharaoh I actually put Tut into a really a tiny little tomb compared to all the other tombs in the valley because I felt that by him having a bigger tomb than Tut, it will show that his legacy was actually better. Yeah. Yeah. Can can I ask you this? Uh, You know, obviously it's a fascinating subject, uh, what you've actually done there. But can I ask you this? You know, leaving Cleopatra out of it because I lectured on uh, Roman about the Romans, and especially about uh, Cleopatra and Mark Antony and Caesar, you know, when they... When they got Octavian, to, Augustus, all of them, uh, yeah. Uh, well, well, well. Uh, can, you, can you tell me... Right, I forgot, I forgot my threads, I forgot what I was going to ask them. No, can you tell me, um, to you, the lead, you know the leaders, these pharaohs, these particular pharaohs, who stands mm-hmm. out to you as... A leader. All right, we we know about Tutankhamun, we know about King Tut, but is the anybody is the anybody there who was actually good and the people adored him and loved him and he did well for the people? Is it, I, I, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Here? Yeah, you know the Pharaoh that that I that is my personal favorite is Pharaoh Ramses the Second, Ramses the Great. Yeah, and. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of films and things like that that have put Ramses into this bad light, but those films are throughout, you know, people doing research now, they see that those films are just actually fiction. Ramses was really very well celebrated. The people loved him. He loved his wife, Nefertari. They were, Ramses really, for me, was the, the greatest pharaoh. That's why he's known as Ramses the Great. 
Uh, hi, hi, uh, it's, it's John here. Um, I'm just going to ask you as well. Um, it's fascinating because I, I, I like Cafu uh, quite a lot because obviously the, the, the basis of the, the, <laughs> the, of the pyramid, Second yeah, Empire yeah. seems to be kind of like a lot much more based around what his actions were and how he influences the future. Um, I was going to say, well, well, going back to the um, uh, the, the monuments and, and the and the pyramids and. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that there were more pyramids, especially in the in the Western Sahara Desert. Um, did you encompass any of that, or did you, did you see there's any evidence for that actually being correct? Well, there are about a hundred pyramids in Egypt, and actually there are more pyramids in in Sudan, which was also known as Nubia. Um, but I I am so sure that there's more stuff to be found in Egypt, um, possibly even pyramids. I mean, so many of them are crumbling. But I'm pretty sure that there's some tombs. I have a feeling about the Valley of the Baboons. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I actually found some stuff. I found fragments of a, of a broken statue of a woman's breast yep. and her ear and an eye. Mm-hmm. And this was just lying there in, in some rubble. So I am so sure that if people keep looking, they're going to find... Yeah. There's a lot of debris there, isn't there, from from variety of different sort of encounters, especially when the Hittites invade. But when you got uh, when you're looking at the um, see the, the the scope of the timeline of Egypt, um, there's a lot of debate now, especially amongst academics, that we're, we're actually positioned a lot of the um, Egyptian kings a lot earlier, a lot later than they should have been. Like there's a couple of more centuries. Yeah, but even know, the pyramids, John, they've been dated now back. Lo- yes, they have. And they've got actually. Uh, when they first came out and said, oh, these are like 2,000, 5,000, whatever years old, then they go, oh, no, they're 10,000 years old. Mm-hmm. This is how technology works. So the more technology we have, the better. I watched Stargate. Have you ever seen the film Stargate? Curtis. <laughs> have you ever seen the film I, Stargate? I never actually watched it. No, he's never watched it. Well, uh, we won't go on about that then. Because but I, I, I was just about to say to him there, but do, do, you know, there's a lot of supposition. You know your stuff, obviously. Uh, do, but do you think that these like ideas that um, the chronology could be put back an extra thousand years or whatever uh, are on the right sort of line, or do you dispute that? I, I wouldn't say a thousand years. Maybe a little bit out, like maybe a hundred, two hundred years. That's yeah. that's that's just my feeling, but. Um, I, I'm no expert on that. There's, there's about like 5,000, 6,000 years of history yeah. to, to soak up about. Maybe, but I, I feel that the pyramids are about, you know, 4,000, 3,500 yeah. years old. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. That's great. Okay, thanks. Sorry. No, no, no. It's just um, a game. What I was about to say is that some people, as I said, uh, you know, Egypt, even today, even myself, you know, if you'd have asked me to go along and, you know, carry me coat while we're doing this documentary, I would have been a little bit reluctant, to be honest, I'm, I'm telling you now. So can you tell me how many of the team went to Egypt uh, to do this documentary? Was it a big team, small team, or <laughs> extremely small team? It was myself and my mother, um, <laughs> and then my team in Egypt was obviously my my agent Ahmed, and I had some amazing Egyptologist friends oh, who helped me yeah. out, called Noor and yeah. Amir. Um, and I, I'm so I'm so excited to be going back to Egypt in October for about three weeks, and um, I. I've got some some very fun things planned and some very interesting things planned. I'm going to be having a look at the wooden coffin of Ramses II. Ah. Um, it's, it's a piece that not a lot of people know about, and I would love to just be able to see it and try and figure out why this amazing king was not buried in a golden sarcophagus, but actually one made out of wood. Well, why did you think that? Why did you think that? Why did you think that happened? Well, you know, they, they did move all the royal mummies, the priests, when all the tomb raiding was happening, they moved all the royal mummies to preserve the bodies and put them in one tomb, 
so I think maybe they put him in that in that coffin for the to carry him across because it was lighter. But another theory that I like to think about is there were a lot of pharaohs who didn't bury themselves in gold coffins, such as Pharaoh Susanes. He buried himself in a silver coffin because he believed that silver was more valuable than gold. Yeah. So I think that maybe Ramses, when he was traveling, when to Kentucky saw like oak trees because I, I believe that the, the coffin is made out of oak and he believed that this wood, which they can't find in Egypt, was actually more valuable than gold at the time because they had to import it from, you know, lower Europe. Yeah, well, this is it. Do you know what? We just had a message in. This is through this. And they just tuned in because they tune in every week. And, uh, you turn about for it, and don't forget that this fella's just tuned in, right? And he said, Frankie yeah. said, hey, that's French. And obviously, Jason had to send him a message, and he said, no, it's about Egypt. He said, no, it's French, because they thought we were talking about the song Fera's Yaka, because we were talking about, uh, you know, tunes before. Yeah. Fera's Yaka. Yeah, Fera's <laughs> Yaka. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, sure, I'm not exactly. spoiling anything for you. It's just that, uh, anyway, Jason put him uh, straight and said, and he apologised anyway. But it's just absolutely <laughs> fascinating. How did you cope with the weather? The, you know, obviously, the sun is uh, extremely hot, especially in desert areas. How did you cope with that? Was it too much? Even your mother, your mum, how did she cope? I think my, my, I think my mother took it a little harder, but for me... It, it was actually spring that time in Egypt in March, so it wasn't that hot. Um, and I, I come from a town where, I mean, the temperatures go into, like, the, the mid-40s. So I'm, I'm pretty used to heat, but actually at that stage in March, I, I would say it's a perfect time to visit Egypt. Oh, right, yeah. No, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think you're right. And, and I was very lucky that there weren't too many tourists. There were still tons of tourists, but it, it was a good time that there was not so many. <laughs> did you, uh, did you uh, enjoy the food there? Did you, did you find that the culture itself was, was uh, something that you just kind of like melded into straight away? Um, or did you find it a little bit difficult coping with the, the, the local produce? You know what? I... I think that I can adapt pretty easily and I, I'm very open to learning about other people's cultures and things. So for me, it was quite quite fine for me. The food, I loved it when we went to the Nubian village, which is just up the river from Aswan. Mm -hmm. um, you have to go by boat. You can't reach it any other way. And the food there was absolutely amazing. I, I can't wait to go back. But also, you know, when I went, I decided that I'm going to be going to dress more modestly so that I will be more accepted by the people there. So I'm very accepting of different cultures throughout the world. Yeah. Really? Listen, a, a question's come in from a Gilchrist, and uh, it's not fair as Jacques, by the way. And he <laughs> said, uh, can you ask your guest what, view, what his view, what, what your view is? of the origin and purpose of the Sphinx, and is it true that it has been, that it has not been entered? Is that just fiction? <laughs> I um, hope this is a relevant are, question for this uh, specialist. It, it is a relevant question because there are a lot of um, theories and things going around on the internet. I mean, people see a picture next to the Sphinx on the left-hand side. There is a tiny little tunnel, but that is a tunnel dug by, I believe, the Romans, who tried to think that there was something under the Sphinx, but actually there is nothing under the Sphinx that's carved out of a solid piece of stone. And for the purpose, I believe, was it was built by, let me get this right, right? My, my theory, built by Pharaoh Jedefra for his father Khufu to protect the three pyramids of his other siblings and his other family members, it was built to protect the tombs of his family. Yeah. And it was also, it was like a landmark for people when they come into Memphis, modern day Cairo, when they see it, they will go, wow, look at this statue. 
it, it's it's something scary. I believe that the Arabs actually, when they invaded Egypt, they were actually quite intimidated. So do you, do you reckon, that's a very the, the good lioness, point. The lioness body is a thick But that's a very good point that you actually make there, you know, people being terrified and that. So do you think that, you know, the case sort of a case is myth, you know, myth, it's just pure unadulterated myth and perpetuated into uh, a case, so to speak, so to keep people away? No, no. Uh, You know, when when you go into one of these tombs, you do feel something quite extraordinary. Um, when we went into Tut's tomb, it's a very eerie feeling. It's a very sad feeling. You know, we got to see his body, and on his eyes, it looks as if he is still crying. And when you see that, you you look and you feel like crying because you just get this feeling that he's still there. Yeah. And it's it's just amazing. And I walked in there, and the second I walked in, it was something I've been waiting for so long to see. I, I just felt like crying, and her her tomb was so peaceful. Yeah, well, so I, I do believe that there are still their spirits attached to. I mean, the tombs are their graves. Yeah. yeah. Well, you are satisfied anyway. At least uh, one of the listeners, by well, they're, they're all made. So we're getting lots of. Uh, Lots of feedback here saying how wonderful this is and we can't wait to see it, which I'll be asking you in a moment. And Ed Gilchrist says, thanks a lot, he says, I like that theory. So well done, you. That's absolutely amazing. So can you tell the listeners uh, where we can see this or what's it going? Is it going on DVD? Is it going to be televised? Or, so can you let us know? No. You know, if, if anybody from the BBC is listening, they have my full permission to screen it. <laughs> um, but at the moment, at the moment, you can watch it on my YouTube channel. We're on about, I believe it's like 8,000 views now. So wow. you can see it on my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com forward slash Curtis Ryan Woodside. Or you can just search Discover Egypt documentary. Yeah. And if any of the listeners, you know, have any questions about ancient Egypt or just want to have a, a chat, you know, feel free to contact me on my social media, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Yeah. That's absolutely wonderful. To be honest, Curtis, you've done a remarkable job. And Ed Gilchrist, oh, who, 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 uh, who asked a question, by the way, I know there was only one question, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Everyone else was just, I don't know, they were just listening to the, your wonderful uh, little chat, shall we say. Um, <laughs> He's, he's actually a Cambridge University man, so it's, uh, oh, to, wow. to, just to just as for him to say thanks, and he likes your theory. That's a big feather <laughs> in your cap, to be honest. Well, well, thank you so much, because, you know, I, I'm not a trained Egyptologist. It's just from doing my own research over the years. I, I would love to study it more, yeah. but... I have been receiving a lot of messages from many Egyptologists who are actually thanking me for my documentary and for helping improve the image of Egypt. And for me, that's what I wanted to achieve. So I, I'm so glad. And I just hope so many more people get inspired. I think you will because you're, you're so young as well and you've got a lot of years ahead of making documentaries and you know, show the world. It doesn't have to be uh, on Egypt, but it could be on anything. Anything it, it could be on Mersey. Absolutely, because I want to do a documentary, and uh, maybe you can do it for me. My ambition is to do immigrants who actually came into Liverpool on the way to uh, America. That's that's an ambition of mine to do a, a documentary on that, because some of the most fantastic people that the world uh, got to know over the years well, uh, who passed through Liverpool. Uh, that's what well, I like to do. We, we have to, we have to talk, Frank. We have to talk. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I'll keep you to that, by the way. And if, 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 if I tell you all about it, I think you'll uh, you'll be over here like a shot. Anyway, <laughs> Curtis, it's a big thank you. Give my love to your mum. Uh, we will. want you on again, by the way, before October, before you go back to Egypt, and let us know a little bit more about what you're going to cover. 
the need you have to get. Yeah, any any time any time you want to have me on my favorite radio station, which is Mersey. Oh, just, yeah, you know, you let me know. Yeah, absolutely. And Jason will be in touch, and we love you on very very soon. Thank you so much, Curtis. Thank you so much, Frank, and you guys have a great evening. So anyway, that was Curtis Woodside. What do you think, boys? Very interesting. He is, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Incredible knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Great documentary, so watch it. Yeah. And this is it, you see. You, you, you've got to look at these uh, particular things. Um, and no pharaoh's jacket. <laughs>